Morning, everybody. Welcome to the Human Factor. Marketing and sales for humans, not robots. I am Alan Langer up to my left or my right. I always get that confused by my vantage point is Steve Brown. He's my co-host. Steven is in Texas and we've got a great guest today and Michael Verrett or Verrett. I forget how to pronounce his last name all the time. So. Uh, I, I just don't just don't you know, you're close enough. That's good for me. <laughs> it's, Brett, it's a human, it's a human, Brett. it's a human mistake. <laughs> well, Michael Verrett, 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 Verrett is joining Verrett. us today. And you're going to, you're going to have a lot of fun with Mike as Steve and I are. And I like everyone. Thank everyone for joining us. This is the human factor. We've been doing this now for a couple of months and it's been a good time. We, we talk about bringing the human element into sales and marketing, getting away from the robotic bots and things that we're that have been inundating our lives. So that's what this is about. We bring on great guests, to talk about all that stuff. Mike is an expert. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we doing today? We're doing good. We're we're excited to have Mike Ferret. You say it like Corvette. Room. Room. <laughs> <laughs> Corvette's good. I usually use Barrette as a uh, as a way to say it. Yes, it's the beauty of French Canadian last names. It's uh Pronounced Barrett, but spelled Barrett. Well, Mike, I want you to tell everyone we we were just talking pre pre call here um, about how you started what you're doing and how important it is to figure out how to explain to possible clients what you actually do, and then how you had to figure that out yourself. And uh, it's a, it's a pretty fascinating story. Mike and I spent a couple hours on the phone a while ago talking about this. So why don't you chat about that, Mike, and tell people what you do and how you can help. Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me, guys. I, am, uh, I, I love the work and the content that you guys create and the conversations are always fantastic. Um, I teach businesses how to talk about themselves. The hardest thing in the world for a business is to get out of their own way when they need to talk to their audience. And having an outside perspective really shifts that for them. When they understand how their audience is receiving information, the order that they receive information, and receiving the information that's in most important to them, a business is going to see a lot more success in terms of their efficiency of communication and how well their, their message lands. So I work with businesses on how to talk about themselves in a way that's going to differentiate them from their com their competition. I learned uh, from a quote to quote Loretta Lynn, you got to be first, best or different. Most of us, if not all of us are not first in what we do and best could be too soon to tell, but different, we all have the opportunity to achieve. And it has to do with how you talk about your business in a way that captures your audience and turns it into a conversation with them they can relate to, that they get information in a certain way. So what I do is work with businesses on the idea of an elevator pitch. And I'll explain that in a minute, but the importance of it is understanding that when you have to talk about your business, it's not about seven to 10 seconds what you say to somebody on an elevator. And I am a perfect example of this, where if I got onto an elevator, say three months ago, I had the hardest time telling people what I did. I was all over the map, but a lot of times it came out as I'm a market consultant. Now, if you get on the elevator with someone and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a marketing consultant, immediately they attach their, themselves to an idea of what that is in their mind. And there's really not much more to the conversation after that. But if I tell people, I teach businesses how to talk about themselves, it invariably leads to a tell me more scenario where they say, huh, What's that mean? Or how does that work? And that's really what you're trying to do with an elevator pitch. Intrigue them on the first floor. The second floor is the insight on what you do. The third floor is how you help people. And the fourth floor is your process. And it starts to create a narrative for how you talk about your business through your marketing, through your website, through your sales decks, through your presentations in a way that you know is going to connect with the audience. So that's what I focus on because I, I had to find someone to help me do this. And I would love to give her a shout out. Abby Wilson was phenomenal. She's 26 years old and understands how to sort through what I was thinking and get it into a clear way to say it. And so I'm pretty positive that the world needs this and it's imperative for businesses to differentiate themselves with their audiences by being themselves, but by communicating on the audience's wavelength and understanding how they need to receive that information. 
Al and I still struggle a little bit when people go, what do you do, Steve? I'm still riffing a little bit, but it's like, it's the hardest thing for someone to say very clearly, what is it you do? And for the person to go, oh, really? Because usually they go, well, what does that mean? It's really difficult. The, 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 uh, I run into it all the time with clients, but I try to meet my goal is I try to meet three to five different new people a week on LinkedIn. I try to do that. And I would say almost a hundred percent of the time when we talk about what they do, they spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about or trying to explain what they do. And I'll joke and I'm like, you just spend half our time together and I still don't know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the exercise, I, the exercise I tell them if they wind up working with me is, Mike, I think you've heard me say this before is pretend you're at a back backyard picnic with your with your eight year old niece and she walks up to you and says, you know, Uncle Steve, what do you do for work? You have 20 seconds to tell her what she does, what you do so she can understand it. Now, she has a 20 second attention span and she's an eight year old. <laughs> if you can do that, can tell her what you do in 20 seconds so she can go tell mom what Uncle Steve does, then you're then you're on the right track. And it's about creating that level of intrigue or disruption on what they expect you to say. I mean, there are, this is, this is very base level, learn how to speak about your business. But if you can do just that on an elevator and picture somebody saying, huh, I was going to get off at the second floor, but now I'm going to get off at the fifth floor. It's because you're giving them a process of uh, an order of information in a way that they can hold on to. And you create that intrigue initially. That is exactly what your website ends up doing. That is exactly what your sales message ends up doing. That's exactly what your capabilities deck ends up doing. And in all those instances, when we get down to it and our bit, all three of us are in the same type of business, how we're going to stand out is really based on the last thing they saw. Okay. So there's a, there's a relevance aspect to this where if i am let's say an advertising agency and i've been asked to present to a company that has whatever their their challenge is let's say they want to increase their presence on social media okay sounds like a classic brand objective that i would see when i was at hasbro my days at hasbro they look at that and say okay this is what we have to have done they send that out to the agency every agency comes in and says this is who we are and this is the work that we've done now let's talk about you that is what a capabilities deck does from an agency. The agencies I work with, I quickly make them understand that the ask you need to interpret into a human way. Okay. So if the ask is increase your social presence, for instance, what you're really trying to do is stop this behavior. Just scrolling through your phone. And if you see something, you stop, you're trying to stop the scroll. That's the human behavior that that company wants to solve for. If I come in as an agency and point that out to them, and say, here's my process for getting there, and then show my work as validation to prove that I do this and I can do it well, I have just locked into, I've identified their problem, made them think about it in a new way, shown them how I solve it, and then proven that it works. And that is the case of information for that audience. But as the business, you feel the need to tell everything about what you've done, and that's where it gets lost. That's where it gets confusing for your, yep. for your eight-year-old niece. Yep. Yeah, it go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. No, I was, you know, in Hasbro, you're selling toys and there's a lot of toys to choose from. And you're trying to get a kid to pick you over. You want you want them to pick Elmo over over whatever Superman or whatever the latest one is, Batman or something. What's the what did you learn at Hasbro that woke you up to this um, little piece that you could apply to most people's businesses? Um, one of the most intriguing things, and it happens in every single business that I've uh, worked in and also interacted with, is this idea that, okay, our product, let's use Elmo as an example, because this is a real example from Hasbro that we ran into. We needed to move to to create the message behind the new feature Elmo. You guys all know Dance With Me Elmo, Tickle Me Elmo. Let's call this one Sing With Me Elmo. For I don't even remember which version it was, but it comes out every year around Christmas time. It's a big feature Q4 driver. 
And we needed to think about how we're messaging that. And what we were looking at specifically was how do people find us if they go on Google and search? What are they, how do we get them to find this product? So initially we're looking at Tickle Me Elmo and all these converse, all these combinations of words on what is going to drive that search strategy. And it took someone from the online team who was pretty new, from the digital team who was pretty new and brought in an unbelievable amount of wisdom to point out, wait a second, Sesame Street is a babysitting device. It is a time management aid for parents. They do not call watch with their two to four year old. Okay, so that's one. Two, if they hear about something on Sesame Street, it's come in the form of a tug on the pant leg because their two or three year old just saw something and came in and responded to it. That's how two to three year olds work. If I'm mom and I'm in the kitchen, let's say wiping down the table and I feel the tug on my leg, the words I'm hearing are not tickle me or sing with me Elmo. The words I'm hearing are mom, oh, Elmo, Elmo, Elmo. Mom as a psychological consumer is thinking he saw something on TV. She's equating it to new. The search term she's using to find our product is new Elmo. It is not sing with me Elmo. It is not the name of the product. It's not a big combination of words. It's how the consumer is thinking in that moment. The need state arrives in the tug of the leg. She has to process that information put it to the internet. That's how she's processing the information, not by our brand or product name. She's not searching for Hasbro, Sesame Street, new, uh, sing with me Elmo, two words. So simplifying it, the truth is that started when Amazon created consumer reviews and rating systems. Because if you think about it, every business does that now, they've adopted that, that philosophy of hearing from their consumers, but it took all the power away from the brand because the brands no longer are able to say, you want what we've got without them saying, do I want what they've got? Let me check with the consumer. They can get real feedback from consumers. Why do they worry about the brand message at that point? And for us as marketers and communicators and working with clients, it's imperative for them to understand that dynamic and they have to meet the audience on their terms. So my job is to clarify their message and ensure on their terms by acting as their audience. If it's an investor pitch, I'm the investor. If it's a sales pitch, I'm the buyer. If it's a capabilities pitch, I'm the, the brand that needs their help. I put myself in their shoes because I need to think as their audience in order to show them what's important to them in the order to say it. And sometimes that arrived, like I had a client who insisted that his pitch was 24 slides. And when we were done, it was seven because we sorted out all the stuff that's important to him as the business owner or the business, you know, doing business. And we focused on what the audience is going to react to. So I think that the, you know, the number one challenge for brands and companies is to understand how their audiences interpret their message and make them realize what's important to them is not what's important to their audience. It almost invariably isn't. Well, what you're saying, Mike, is so brilliant because it just, it makes so much sense and it, it has followed what's happened since what, 1994 when the internet really first came into play. When prior to that, businesses were in the driver's seat. Sales reps were in the driver's seat because they held all the information. So you had to go to them as the consumer and say, give me, you know, tell me about your product. Now the cons you know, it's completely flipped. The consumer is in charge yep. and they're like, the, I call it informational ammunition. You know, you walk into a car dealership. Now you have five pages of information. Um, this is what I want. And this is what I want to pay. And yep. I don't want to talk to you. And it's like, they're, they're, they're protecting themselves because they don't want to get false information, which was, you know, always happening in the past. So it's really so important what you're talking about. And I want you to, I want you to talk about how this applies to, I've been helping clients recently with proposals and I'm doing exactly what you, you're doing is we start the proposal talking about the client, not about the company. Every proposal you see in the world uh, that's been designed, you know, the first four pages about how great the company is and, and, yeah. and maybe some case studies in the beginning and you don't even get to the client's problem until page six. Mm -hmm. So I've been flipping that script and, and talk about that if you, if, if you, if you don't mind. Well, here's, I'll talk about it in the form of my favorite example that anyone who's ever gone out to get a job can relate to, and it's your resume. Okay. If you think back to when you wrote your resume, your focus 
for three or four hours was fine tuning your accomplishments and what you've done and your role there and using words like strategy or drive or initiate or develop. Mm -hmm. And you spend a lot of time doing that. But here's the reality. The person who's hiring, who's going to read that resume, looks at resumes for an average of seven to nine seconds each, which means that your effectiveness line is one to two sentences. If they don't grab on to those one or two sentences, they never see the rest of the stuff that you've done that you spent all that time talking about. So apply that to a business and your pitch to a business. Your first job is to connect with them on their wavelength, okay? And that's usually done with a simple insight about what they're up against and putting it in terms that's gonna really say, yes, that's exactly it, you get it, okay? So if you can do that, if you can connect with their problem up front in terms that are going to make them think very realistically and personally about it. Like, yes, that's exactly what I'm going through. Then when you introduce the solution, it becomes a lot stickier. It's, it's going to be much more memorable for them. So back to Hasbro, quick example of this. We had to sell more Monopoly. Okay. Monopoly is a game that is purchased once for say $20 and kept for 20 years. It's in the game cabinet, and I'm sure you guys can relate to that. We want to sell more, so how do we do it? We need to find an insight that is going to drive it. But that insight only goes as far as the people we're presenting to. It may never see the light of day if they don't buy into it. Right? So we found an insight that we put on the first slide of our presentation to upper management, to the C-suite. And it said, it was from a BuzzFeed poll, 50% of people cheat when they play Monopoly. There were 46 people in the room and at least 75% of them started sharing stories about either them cheating or someone who used to cheat all the time playing it. And we made it impossible for them to escape that idea because they personalized it, they internalized it. And I'll talk about the importance of that, but once we did that, the next slide was introducing Cheaters Edition Monopoly. And Cheaters Edition Monopoly, you were trying to get away with cheats without getting caught and the cheats are on cards on the board. And if you do get caught, when you go to jail, we added a big long handcuff chain and you were handcuffed to the go to jail space. Everybody in the room bought into it because we had them thinking about people cheating when they're playing Monopoly. And that's the power of understanding the perspective of your audience and giving them something to latch on to. Because if they, the movie Inception explains this with Leo DiCaprio, an idea is more addictive than, than any drug. You can't get rid of it once it's in your head if you make it your own. So if I say to you two, as an example, as a demonstration, if I say to you two, think of Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles, you immediately are going to have a postcard vision of what I'm talking about, the pier, whatever. But if I ask you, think of a beach, you two are totally in different places right now because of your experiences and because of what you're conjuring up in your mind. If I can get you attached to that beach and then explain how I get you to that beach, I'm, you're with me the entire way. It's not just a postcard to you. It's an experience. It's something that has been absorbed and molded into your mind and your memory. That's what you need to do at the beginning of this, right? Is how do you trigger their challenge in a way that they're going to say, yes, he understands and he's made it real. I can go on. Like, it's just something that they acknowledge. It makes your life a lot easier. You create that connection. Then as you go into how you solve that problem for them, the work that you talk about that you've done with others after that becomes validation of proof that you can help them. And that's the right order to deliver it. Yeah, that, that emotional when you can trigger them succinctly with a statement that moves them emotionally and puts them into a place where they've, they've gone there, then the brain is assembling all the details and the brain doesn't doubt its details. It doesn't reject its details. It'll reject your details that if mm -hmm. you're them, but if you get the brain to go to that place, it assembles its version of reality and then they feel safe. They feel understood. They feel that you get me and the brain did all the work. Yep. A hundred. I mean that, that you can't make it more simple than that. If 
they already have something in their head that you're tapping into and it's personal, like it's in their mind as a memory or experience, they can't help but conjure that up. It's an, it's an automated response. They don't have any control over that because that's how our minds work. We hearken back to experiences all the time. So going back to that idea of the, the reason this is great, going back to that idea, that we need to increase our presence on social media, both paid and organic. That's a real objective that a company may give to a, uh, you know, a content company or digital company uh, agency to do that for them. But thinking about the genesis of that objective, somebody way upstream said, people aren't looking at our stuff. And then downstream, when it gets to the senior manager level, it's on a to do in their personal development plan as I need to accomplish this. It's very sterile. It's not relatable. But if you push them towards that action of what you're really trying to stop is this is this ongoing, which you see everybody do on their phones now, just looking, scrolling and stop, scroll, stop, scroll. That's exactly what people are experiencing. Draw their attention to that. And now the person who had that objective on their development plan is now very much attached to the solution or the idea of what you need to solve. The, this is all, uh, it, it all goes back to the very simple concept of leading with the problem that you solve as the company rather than leading with your product. And um, it it's amazing still how many people don't get it or that's not just simply not trained, especially in the area of sales. I do this weekly thing on LinkedIn. You guys may have seen it. I, I write a little story of two mice called Ping and Pong. One, one's I love a, Ping and Pong. A, Ping and Pong. So one's, one's a, you know, smart sales rep and Ping is, is the stupid trained corporate sales rep that doesn't, you know, always <laughs> about the numbers. But the, the most popular one I did was I had them both at a networking function and one guy went up to Ping and said, hey, what do you do? And Ping says, I sell cheese. And then he says, oh, okay. And then he went to Pong and goes, what do you do? And Pong said, well, you know, at night when you get those cravings for something delicious and and guy goes, yeah. He goes, well, I sell the cheese to satisfy that craving. And then the it. guy gives Pong his business card and Ping is all mad. He's like, how'd you do that? And he's like, I just led with the problem, not with the product. So, but here's the point. That got so many comments like, wow, I never thought of that. What a great idea. Oh my, it's like people were like, it was like the first time they ever heard of the concept. It's uh, the challenge. The challenge is you put yourself into a role of what you do and you start to define it that way. So let's say that cheese salesman, Ping, is a really, really good process oriented numbers kind of guy, but he sucks at talking with people. Like his strong suit is not talking about what he does. His strong suit is saying, here are the results of what I do. How do you bring that out of them the way that Pong did it? And it becomes about connection with your audience and that's it. Like your message connects because the audience needs to feel it that way. So let's, let's use a very good example, a very real example that all three of us will relate to. You mean two talking mice are not, are not real examples? Come on. No, 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 no. I'm going to show no. you what happens. No, I'm just kidding. Well, Alan, sorry, Mike. Sorry, Mike. But Alan stole it. We were originally going to name our podcast "Ding and Dong." And <laughs> he was Dong, and I was Ding. <laughs> we didn't roll I'm not it. Sure there's, I'm not sure there's a winner in that scenario. <laughs> but think about think about the the importance of connecting with your audience on their terms. Okay, car insurance. And Alan, I've told you this example before. Car insurance is a great example. There's Liberty Mutual, there's Progressive, there's Geico, there's there's Hancock Insurance, uh, all of these insurance companies, okay? All the selling general. a commoditized item. But the general. The general is another example of that. They're all selling a very commoditized thing, okay? It is what it is. We'll save you money because we're trimming here and there, but it's all about saving money, getting the best rate on your car insurance. Now, 1990, 1990s, Prudential was like a rock. Allstate was the good hands people. And Liberty Mutual was all starched banker collars and Windsor knots. And it was a very serious business insurance. Those are archetypes that their brands chose to portray, okay? Like the, the um, hero archetype, the leader archetype, the sage or fatherly archetype. Those are all brand identities, if you want. Geico comes along so easy a caveman can do it. And they are the jester. They hop in as humor 
with humor as their vehicle, okay? If you think about now, all those companies that I named, can you think of one that isn't using humor as a device? Even, I mean, Liberty Mutual uses the term Liberty Bibbity in an ad, and they have <laughs> Limu, Emu, and Doug as their people. Flo and Jamie have become a household name, but every single one of those agencies is doing the exact same thing now because humor is what their audience is responding to in that commoditized market. And it's just the power of the audience to sway that message is what they're seeing. Now, a company shifting in that direction is like turning the Titanic, right? Steering the Titanic, it's hard, but they're doing it because their audience demands it. That's it. That's what's resonating with their audience and they're all coming around to it. So I think it's, uh, if you're, if you're spouting off about your business and what's important to you in a way that hasn't connected with their problem, what's the point? You're missing the boat. I sell cheese is, is lazy. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't define who that is. There's no first, best or different. I don't see any of those three ingredients. All right. The other thing stupid is, ping. Yeah. <laughs> ping doesn't get it. He so doesn't get it. The problem for ping in this case is that ping selling the obvious external challenge. Okay. Well, I'm going to buy cheese. Well, pick my cheese is what he's doing. But Pong is going is going to an internal thing that's emotional and that's why it really feels like you understand me when you go you know that time you go to the refrigerator at night and you're just wanting something to snack on we make cheese that's the perfect thing for that time well you're really addressing the real problem mm -hmm. not the obvious problem but the real problem that feels right because it connects with you emotionally and when you were giving that example of elmo yep so that ad got the little kid emotionally involved where he's going and or she's going and promoting it and it helps the adult understand what what the kid wants that's brilliant marketing mm -hmm. and it's um i mean it has a lot to do with understanding especially when you're talking to an audience that you, you're creating something for an audience that's that young, right? We talk about the idea of who the purchase decision maker is. In the scenario I gave you, the purchase decision maker is the kid. You know, it's not the mom deciding to do it. It's the kid pushing that message with a tug on the pant leg and I want Elmo. And that's how a real, like we're talking about, this whole thing is about being human and understanding the human aspects of marketing. If you don't understand how to have a conversation with someone, that's your number one challenge. If you would you ever get into a conversation and just, all right, let's have a conversation, Steve. Um, do you like warm weather? Yes. And then that's all you say. That's not a conversation. That's an inquisition. So the important part there is understanding if you talk about it in a way that relates to their challenge or how they're feeling about that challenge at that time, I'm hungry in the middle of the night, everybody's done that, they're much more apt to listen to your solution. If you lead with, we're the best cheese ever, so what? It doesn't speak to getting up in the middle of the night for a snack or the fact that I'm hungry. So, I mean, the, there's no underestimating the importance of communicating with people in conversational terms in the order they need the information. Uh, I, I look at FAQ pages as a great example of this, it's a practical example of this, where you need to lead them through information. Your first job is to understand how they're going to ask the questions in their mind. What is it? What does that mean? How does it work? How does this little piece work? How does this little piece of that little piece work? Their mind is starting general. You wouldn't write your FAQs for your website starting with, here's how the time, the watch works. You'd start with it, here's why it's important to understand the time. So you have to lead them through the conversation with your information. That's exactly what Pong does. Pong, in that instance, points out, yeah, you get hungry. Here's something to think about when you're hungry. 
and you connected to them in a way that Ping can't. So, well, why do you see this coming Mondays? It's 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 another uh, it's another example of of <laughs> how I won't give it away, but how how sales reps have been trained to think and how they need to start thinking better. Um, you know, especially today going forward with with everyone being able to. I think I saw a statistic the other day: ninety seven percent of all uh, purchasing journeys start online. Like now, everybody is starting everything online. They're doing their research. They're checking reviews, and if you think people aren't looking reviews, you're you got your head under the the all state rock. You're just not. Um, you're out of your mind. Yeah, you're out of your mind. So, Mike, if if we've got some small business owners, some solopreneurs listening to this show, give them a couple of tips on how to actually to go from, you know, all right, I've always led with my I, I sell a copy machine and it does a thousand pages a minute and staples, and how do I change something, especially a commoditized item like you know, tech services or copy machines or things like that, that, you know, so many competitors sell, how would, what would you tell them to be different in, in a situation like that? Well, the, the first thing to do is look at your immediate, like, what is your competitive set? So let's use I, a, a member of our group who's, she's absolutely fantastic. She runs a, a public relations firm and has for years. And part of her success, I had coffee with her and talked to her about this. Part of her success is understanding the fact that her competition is other PR firms. And we went online and looked at some other PR firm websites, okay? And they all say essentially the same thing. We're a PR firm, we're a PR agency, we'll get your word out. But in talking with Betty and how she pre presents and positions what she does, we were talking about this idea of writer's block. And it came out of a conversation with Betty on she was telling me in college, she was known for getting her friends out of writer's block. She had to say pulling the words, right? Hmm. So the way she talks about her business is not, I'm a PR agency and I'll get your word out. It's businesses get writer's block. I help them find the words. And it relates to her and what she's best at, her function in public relations and her ability to be successful is based on the fact that she can help these companies tell their stories effectively and choose the right words to do it. So if you look at five stories or talk to five people who are in PR, four of them say, I'm a PR person, I'll get your word out. The fifth says, I help businesses get out of writer's block. Which one becomes memorable to you? Mm -hmm. So go back to why you got into business in the first place and think about that passion or that idea, all right? That was 100% of why you got into it. And if, if it's to make money, I can't listen to that. That's silly. Go get a job at a drive through if you just want to make money. You wouldn't be lunatic enough to start your own business if it was just making money. You have something you want to share. If you can get back to what that is and talk about your business in a way that pays back to that, you're always going to stand out and you're always going to speak and, and talk about your business with passion because it means something to you. So in Betty's instance, the way she leverages what she's best at, finding words, getting people out of writer's block, she could talk to that all day long. Oh, tell me about that. She knows how it feels. She knows what the process is like because she's done it since college in, in terms of the conversation we had. That sets her apart from the other four PR agencies that that client may be looking at. And at the end of the day, that's your immediate competition. So if you're a, a business owner, do a little bit of sit down and think about why you're doing this in the first place and what you're bringing to it that's most important. Because here's what happens to every single business owner. They have an incredible idea. 100% of their business is based on this idea. Then they start building their business and they have to worry about legal or website or how am i going to sell this or i have to build these packages or i have to create a sales deck and that idea gets whittled away to a tiny percentage of what it was get back in touch with that it's gonna make you understand all right this is what i'm best at this is why i'm doing this and this is what my message has to be you know i was thinking about while you were talking how how that Elmo situation got the kid all jacked up about Elmo. You're going to buy an Elmo, aren't you, this week? Yeah. No. <laughs> this is interesting. I'm starting to find no, a new sales no. channel. 
<laughs> my brother stole my Elmo last time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I love to cook. And so oh, I'm cool. on YouTube goofing around and I run into this, this series of where this guy's in a forest. He doesn't talk, but he cooks right there. But he's got this really cool knife that he's always, <laughs> okay? And he does, literally, I watched several of these and they never talk. They tell you what the ingredient, I mean, they have the little pop-up of what the ingredients are and they have a little bit of humor. They even have this owl at the first where you, you pet the little owl. <laughs> but at the end of it, I noticed that I want the knife, okay? And so what do I end up doing when someone asks me, what do you want for your birthday? I said, knife. knife. <laughs> I literally did, but I loved watching that. So what's beautiful is it's not, it's not a, um, it's not a commercial. It is, but it's like you get pulled in, you can see yourself using a knife and cooking. Oh, that's how you do that sauce. But I it's like, do that. yes, it's awesome. Anyway, it's called uh, Amazon or A L M A Z A N knives. Yeah. But go go Google that or YouTube it, and you'll see exactly a demonstration of what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's connecting to them on their terms, right? It's mm -hmm. I want to do that with that knife. It's not somebody telling me you want this knife because the edge isn't going to do this or this or that. You just right. saw somebody using it, and that really, I mean, that's a great point, Steve. That's what content marketing is supposed to do for us now, right? Is demonstrate and give people that feeling of what they're getting. And missing that boat becomes a big problem. Or if you're getting on that boat with the wrong, the wrong stuff, you're in trouble. Like mm -hmm. if your job is to educate, you're doing it wrong. Your job is to engage them with your message. If it's educate, send them a PowerPoint, have them sign up and get a newsletter. Like that's not what you're trying to do with your content. What you're trying to do is get them to think about the knife or think about the cheese on terms that they can relate to. You're trying to get them to imagine themselves in that story with that knife, having fun. Like you're watching those, those guys there in Serbia and it's just beautifully shot. And it's like, I really enjoy it, but it's like, I was just thinking it made me go knife. Yes. Right? I want yes. knife. Yeah. The, how, about, uh, the... how about the big green egg grill? You guys yeah. know what that is? Okay. Yeah. That thing is just a heavy grill. It's a heavy Weber grill. You have to use lump charcoal on it. If you're smoking something, it's really hard to add more charcoal. It's kind of a pain in the ass. The lowest price one that fits a burger only is $300. But people want this because they have this romanticized idea about, oh, I got the big green egg. Look how heavy it is. And the lid comes up like this. And there's a whole section of Ace Hardware that's dedicated to it. And they're getting you to buy into a lifestyle and you feel the need to do it. When I could tell you I could get the exact same effect with a pork shoulder in an electronic smoker that I plug in in my you know, that I just plug in, turn on, throw the thing in, it's a lot faster, it's not as messy. But I've bought into this consumer dream, right? With the big green egg, that it's this big, heavy thing that's perfect, it holds the heat, blah, blah, blah. I picked up what they're laying down because I want to grill like they do. Yeti coolers is another example of that. Why do I need a Yeti cooler? Or four it speaks of to a lifestyle and oh man i could take this to the beach and it, it zips even if there's sand in it yeah that's what i need like we're <laughs> they're doing it all the time and getting you to buy into this lifestyle idea with those two brands you know weber doesn't need to do that they just sell a bunch of grills and they're all lined up and it goes back cheaper. to yeah it goes back to the steve said the word story i yep. mean uh when, when you i have a whole chapter in my book about it it's part of my training if you can put the person, the, the potential client, the customer, make them envision themselves what their life is like after they own your product or service, they're going to want it more. An example I use when I 100%. sold sunrooms, 
I would never go into a house trying to sell a forty thousand dollar sunroom and start talking about the aluminum and the and the insulated roofs and the glass and everything. They trained you to do that. Two weeks of training about the thickness of the aluminum and the rollers and all of this crap. I would just go in and say, imagine yourself sitting there in your backyard with a cup of coffee, looking out your brand new sunroom at to, in, into the woods. That's that's what they want. They could give a shit that the, that the roof was ten inches thick. They really could care less. And yeah. if you can or, put or your customer in in that scenario, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. You painted the picture for them. Yeah, painted the picture, but you put them in it. So, like you know, in the copy machine scenario, I, I dealt with a, a, a client who sold copy machines. I said instead of selling the the features of the copy machine, because that's what all your competitors are doing. Tell a story about the cop machine. Tell a story about, you know, I had a customer whose daughter, uh, uh, the flyers didn't come in for her Girl Scout cookies. And we they came in on a Saturday and this machine pumped out 2000 flyers in an hour. It was great. Who, who are they going to buy the copy machine from or who are they going to remember? It's, just, it's, a, it's, it's really you got to you got to put your customer in the position of how they're going to feel after they own your product. hundred percent, Alan. I mean, the, the copier is a great example of you need a copier to make copies of stuff. Like you, if you need to make copies of stuff, you need a copier. There's not really any other way to explain that. So what do you want to know <laughs> as the consumer? Is it going to work all the time and is it going to make copies? The features are, it makes copies. Who cares? <laughs> I already know that. The damn thing's called a copier. What I want to know is when I have to print those flyers, is it going to print the damn flyers? Yeah, that's the that I we could. Uh, there's no way to argue it. That's what they're thinking. Why would they buy a copier? There's no other reason. You know yeah. why this copier is good? Because it's not going to run out of ink like this one does when it does. It's not going to break down like this one does. And there's fewer things to fix. Much better story to me. You know, that's brilliant, yeah. Alan. Brilliant. We're talking with Mike Ferret with Ferret and Associates yep. on how to talk about your business so people understand what you do right away. So, Mike, what's the one thing that you love to say that you don't get to tell people about very much? What is it? Maybe something personal, and maybe this is the day you want to announce it. What is it that you'd love to say that we didn't ask you about? Wow, this is a great. I know he does that every show, and it's just like I feel bad for the question. guests. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very intriguing open ended question. Okay, so something about me I own 150 154 pairs of sneakers, and one of them is worth $9,000. And I have an obsession with street culture graffiti actually a friend of mine's a graffiti artist made this prince tribute here the day that he died and gave it to me it's just a sketch but the idea of like street lifestyle or that urban lifestyle marketing has always been something that's appealed to me and sneakers became an incredible outlet for me to do what i really enjoy and find something that means something to me that speaks to me my language and uh, I talk about the idea of you've got business, but then you've got what you do for yourself and you've got life and love, right? It's important to find that life love balance on the side of your, of your hustle, of your business. For me, my life is I really enjoy cycling. Good for my life, good for my health, et cetera. And it gives me an outlet. Love for me, the love side of that is this urban culture and how that lifestyle permeates everything and how it begins with an idea that somebody has and it propagates through music and then through sport. And, you know, two years after Pharrell Williams wearing a sweater on The Voice, everybody's wearing that sweater and you can see the propagation of fashion. So that's sort of a fun fact about me. It's not anything dreamy or anything, but uh, fun for me to talk about. I've even got my, you know, my little Optimus Prime with his sneakers on. <laughs> To represent <laughs> so i don't know if that's what you were looking for uh, the other thing is i have debilitating social anxiety how's that works for me i i probably had it and just didn't know it <laughs> no one thing you're listening to the about, human factor 
with uh, Steve Brown and Michael Verrett, and um, we're having a great time. We're actually heading to the end of the show right now, but um, Michael, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, how do companies who are listening say, holy crap, I need Mike to help me with my message? What do they do? Ah, well, if you want to learn how to talk about yourself, go to my website, verrettenassociates.com, and you can book time right from there. More importantly, it very efficiently explains what I do. Um, there's not a lot of bells and whistles, and it's a very sort of fluid process based on the business. But if you want to understand what I do, go to berettonassociates.com, or you can email me, mike at berettonassociates.com anytime, and find me on LinkedIn. I am constantly on LinkedIn. It's my favorite business hobby. That's Verrett with two R's and one T. That's right. That is correct. Like Corvette. I learned that this morning. Yes. <laughs> All right. Any last words, uh, Mr. Steve Brown from Texas? No, I think by, by getting people to connect emotionally and see themselves in the future with whatever it is that you want to help them with is the secret to, I think, what you would call enlightened marketing and sales. Is all you're doing is saying, hey, I understand you and you're, you're safe here, but this is what it could look like in the future. And I think if you could get that going and, and be more inclined to it, then you've, you've just separated yourself from most of the pings out there and you've oh, become a pong. <laughs> I love it. 100%, 100% right. Couldn't agree more. Michael, thanks for joining us. This has been a great, great episode. It'll be available for folks who uh, want to watch the whole thing or didn't get it. Uh, we'll have it available uh, as a recording. Steve, always a pleasure, my friend. We're uh, signing off. Thanks for joining us, everyone. The Human Factor, marketing and sales for humans, not robots. We are signing off. We'll see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys.